Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm glad you come here to join us for worship this morning. Welcome to the Seventh-day Adventist Church of Hillsboro. It is a pleasure to be here this morning. It is gorgeous outside, isn't it? I know I was uh, talking to my wife and saying, what a gorgeous week we're ahead, having ahead of us. Good weather. And I said, what a, what a wonderful place to be this morning. Uh, no, other, no other place I would be in church this morning. Um, we are blessed this morning. We have some, uh, some guest music. We have some Florine back again doing for a, a little uh, organ music this morning. And we appreciate that. And also this morning, uh, Gary Snyder, one of our elders, will be giving the message this morning. And, and I know that we've been praying for this message, and God has a message for us this morning. So we'll um, let the Spirit lead this morning. Well, it's nice having you this morning. Next week, we will be having potluck. Um, so um, bring food for uh, all of us to share. Um, I, kn- I know that COVID rules are getting less and less now. We're getting to the safer levels. Uh, so it's nice that we could have our, our meals back together first the fellowship meal. So at this moment, we're trying to have potluck on the first and third Sabbath of the month. Uh, so we could handle, hopefully we could handle that amount. So we'd love to have you here next Sabbath to come together with a congregation. May the Lord bless us in our worship this morning. God bless. Welcome, everyone. It's that uh, time of the week again where we can come together collectively, uh, worship the Lord on the, on the Holy Sabbath day. Uh, we've, we've actually learned a lot about the Sabbath in our Sabbath school lesson this week, um, how it's the sign of the covenant, sign of the uh, everlasting covenant with the Lord. And it's a, a day of, of uh, restoration and it shows, uh, commemorates creation and, and redemption through Christ. Um, when Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room, um, he was a mere hours from going through Gethsemane and going through the, to the cross. He was thinking a lot about his, about his disciples, a lot about us, actually. And he um, said that there would be a, he would provide a helper, a comforter, a counselor, um, to to be with us when he had to to leave and go back to heaven to to begin his intercessory ministry. Let's sing today about the Holy Spirit. We're going to start with "Sweet Sweet Spirit," number two sixty two in the hymnal.
He's also seeing spirit song. So when Jesus said that he was going to send a helper and then send a comforter, he said that helper would convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Um, convict the world of sin because the world did not, does not, did not believe in Jesus. And, and Jesus was equating uh, lack of belief to sin. Let's, let's sing Refiner's Fire and, and let, that, let that spirit uh, uh, come deep within us. Purify my heart, let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart, let me be as gold, pure gold. Refiner's fire, my heart's one desire. To be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Purify my heart. Cleanse me from within and make me holy. Purify my heart. Cleanse me from my sin deep within. Refiner's fire. My heart's one desire is to be. Set apart 
for you, my master, ready to do your will. Refiner's fire, my heart's one desire is to be Welcome to stand with us and sing our opening song this morning on this blessed Sabbath day. Sing a new song to the Lord, number 33. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I have this morning the mission story, and I'm going to talk about Sabbath school. I'm going to open up with an Ellen White quote, and it goes this way. Our Sabbath schools are nothing less than Bible societies, and in the sacred work of teaching the truth of God's word, they can accomplish far more than they have accomplished thus far. The Sabbath school, when rightly managed, possesses marvelous power and is adapted to doing a great work, but it is not now what it may and should be. And this is a powerful quote, and it's talking about Sabbath school as a whole, but specifically today, I want to talk about children's Sabbath school and how powerful it is and how much it impacts children's lives. A couple weeks ago, I don't know if you guys noticed, but I, I brought a friend, and this is a coworker. And the reason why she came was because when she was a little girl, her neighbor invited her to Sabbath school, and she would go. And when she found out that I was Adventist, she said, oh, I remember going as a kid, and I have amazing memories of going to this, she called it a little class, and they had activities, and they had these stories, and I loved going. And when the time came of me building relationships with her and I invited her, she was more than happy to come. And when she walked in, she was so happy, and she said, I have so many memories of coming to church. So my appeal this morning is to, if you know of anyone that has small children, please, please, we have an amazing Sabbath school that we're starting. I know with COVID, things have been really difficult, but we, we started something and we're starting every Sabbath at 10 o'clock. We have a primary class and we have a kindergarten class. So if you have a brother or sister, or if you know of someone, just please come and bring them. 
it, I can't describe, this is just one testimony, but I hear this over and over again of grown men and women saying, I remember Sabbath school. So it has an impact in our children. So please bring them again every Sabbath at 10. We have an amazing Sabbath school for them. So thank you and happy Sabbath. Is this, is this on? Oh, great, perfect. All the kids, please come up now. If you are, I don't know, let's say 15 or younger, come up now. Come on. We haven't had Sabbath school with some interaction in quite some time. But come on up, kids, all kids. If you are older than 15, you are welcome to come up here as well. And I'm going to have you guys start in a line. So I'm going to have you turn and then everyone get behind Sophia. So right here, Sophia, facing me and line behind Sophia, line behind Sophia. No, like in a straight line. There we go. Scoot a little bit over. Scoot a little bit over. Perfect. Awesome. Any other kids want to join us for this little illustration? I have this cup here. I have a cup a few inches big or wide, and it's this little cup right here. It's this little glass cup, okay? I'm going to set this glass cup right here, okay? And everyone gets a little paper ball. Paper ball for you. Paper ball for you. Okay? Paper ball for you. Paper ball for you. And then one more. You guys will get a shot at this too. Okay, stand right there. All you have to do is try to get that paper ball in this little cup. You only got one shot at it, though, okay? Sophia, go first. One shot at it. Ooh, close. Noah, you're up. So, Soph, come sit right there. Take a shot at it. Try to get it in the cup. Ooh, close. Okay, you come sit. Eden, give it a shot. Ooh, real close. Next. Give it a shot. Try to make it in. Ah, almost. You come right here. There you go. There you go. There you go. Did she make it? No, almost. Ooh, another close one. You got it? Ooh, first one to hit the rim. Oh, I see you cheating. I see you. Smart kid. Smart kid. You get one. Okay. Okay. I, 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 you can come sit right here. Come sit right here. And then you get one. All right, you get one more try. Come on. Ready? Try it. Okay, she didn't want to throw it. Ooh, okay. You guys come over here. So we have a ball, a little paper ball. We have a glass cup, and we're trying to make You want to put it in? Okay, never mind. That's fine. Don't worry about it. I'm, don't worry about it. So the illustration is this, guys. Sometimes we wake up in the morning. <laughs> almost. We wake up in the morning, okay? And we want to have a, a great day. In fact, we want to have a perfect day. And to make it from here to there, you have to have a perfect throw, Okay, right? It's got to be apps from the, from the angle to the velocity. The, the throw has to be perfect. And we wake up and we want to have a perfect day. We don't want to get in trouble. We don't want to, to lie or be mean. But sometimes our days aren't perfect, right? Are your days perfect? Are your days perfect? Are your days perfect? No, not at all, right? And, and we feel like we only have one shot to be perfect. But let me tell you something. If Jesus was standing right here, could he make it in that? Could he make it in the cup? Yeah. yeah. Could he do it over and over and over again? Yeah. Jesus is, is perfect, right? He had a perfect day again and again and again because he's God. So here's the thing, when you want to have a perfect day or when you want to have a perfect moment, all you got to do is go to who? God. Jesus. I got a little Jesus. Yes, of course, Jesus. Why? Because he's the only one who's perfect.
You see, when you wake up in the morning or when you're going to school, all you have to do is ask help from Jesus because he can help you get the ball in the cup. Are you with me? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you because you're awesome and you get, to, you get the ball in the cup every single time. We need help with our school or with listening to our parents or sometimes even doing chores or waking up early. We just need your help. And it's hard sometimes to get the ball in the cup. And so just help us. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, Amen. that's it. Thank you guys. I invite you to turn in your hymnals to hymn number 648. This hymn actually comes from a symphony written by Gustav Holst, a British composer in the late century. Uh, The tune is almost haunting, but the words are glorious. And as we remember this holiday that we celebrate this weekend, I found it fitting to probably introduce this hymn to you because I think it's probably very unfamiliar to you. I will play through it, oh, like one and one half times, but I urge you to look in the hymnal uh, to ponder the meaning of the words.
I want to say amen again. It's been a while since we've had Florian here playing, and I didn't realize I'd missed it so much to have that beautiful organ again and that beautiful music. Praise the Lord. This is the uh, time when we can come before the Lord's throne and um, ask special praises or prayer requests. Um, I only have one that I've uh, been asked to share publicly, and that is we have several requests for Bible study. And several is how many, Gary? Is there a number? <laughs> but uh, that is definitely a blessing and a praise that um, the Lord is bringing his people home and uh, they're seeking so as we move ahead with our prayer, I would invite those who are able to kneel, and uh, we will kneel before the, the Lord's throne and uh, invite his presence with us this morning. Gracious Father, once again, we want to praise you and thank you for who you are, how great thou art, and also that... Every week you give us this special day as a reminder. And oh, what a wonderful day it is today. That, uh, we have the sunshine and we also have the S-O-N, sunshine, uh, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the supreme sacrifice that you have made in giving your son. And Jesus, we cannot fathom that you came to this earth and lived as one of us, but sinless, a sinless life that we may be saved. How great thou art, and I don't think we can thank you enough. And we are constantly in awe. And we have been told that we are going to spend eternity studying and learning more and more of your love. How far how deep we don't know, Lord. We are just looking forward to being with you and uh, learning more and more. Father, as we uh, are privileged to have this church, uh, you have given it to us, entrusted it to us. Father, thank you. We pray that we are doing uh, the work that you have asked us to do or instructed us to do. And um, so we pray that your holy presence will be with us this morning. And um, we thank you for the message that Gary is going to share with us this morning. And um, I look forward to that. And again, we just thank you for this wonderful day that we can spend with you. And in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Danny, wherever you are, for giving me the opportunity to uh, to talk with the church family. And he, early on, we talked about this being a sermon, and I said, no, it's 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 not a sermon. <laughs> it's it, it'll be just uh, sharing my experiences with the church family. So, uh, and I noticed he called it a message, and that's that's fine. Um, what I what I want to share with you is the difference. Well, before we start that, <laughs> let's. Forgive me. Let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, may your presence be here. Lord, may you be seen and you be heard. We ask in your holy name. Amen. And what I wanted to talk about is just the difference between doing for Jesus and living in Jesus. Uh, and, and they are different. They lead, they lead to very different outcomes in life. Um, and unfortunately, so many times we seem to spend time doing for Jesus. And you understand the difference. Doing for Jesus is things I go out and do, and then I go back, and I'm myself again. I, I go to work, or I go do whatever, fun, games, things. It's intermittent. 
that kind of experience isn't really what God wanted for us. He wanted us to experience living in Jesus, which is a continuous experience by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, I I missed that somewhere. But in the intermittent experience, there's a lot of fear and angst. Am I doing enough? (laughs) You know, um, that, that seems to be... Well, that was my my Christian experience, but living in Jesus is much different. Uh, well, let's read Romans eight fifteen and sixteen. Romans eight fifteen and sixteen. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, you know, Daddy, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So, you know, that, that continual living is in the spirit and Paul's talking about it here in Romans the doing for Jesus uh, at least in my experience was a little bit like a friend a good friend giving you a car and telling you I I want you to go out and run errands for me out in the community and uh, and oh by the way if you when you run out of gas there's an infinite supply of fuel available. And so we, I, got in the car, and you start driving around and doing the errands and things that you think are right, going to church, Sabbath school, whatever. You're doing those things for Jesus. Uh, and that, that all goes well, and you're having fun uh, until you run out of gas. And for some inexplicable reason, we, we forget that there's an infinite supply of gas available for the asking. And so what do we do? Well, we've got this car, it's lovely. We're doing for Jesus, but we forget about the power, the gas. And so we get out and start pushing it. And we push it along, and that works pretty good as long as the ground is flat, level. If the ground, you know, eventually you're going to come to a a hill. If it's a a small hill, you might be able to push it up and you might make it. And that's fine. But eventually you're going to come to a bigger hill and now you've got a choice. You either stop, give up, or you go back and try and figure out what went wrong. Uh, I'd like to read, there was a, well, and this is sort of a plug for, for Tuesday. On Tuesdays at uh, 6.30 in the evening, we have a wonderful time of sharing, studying together, and praying together. Uh, but in this book that we were going through, there was, a, uh, there was a quote from Ellen White that just kind of grabbed a hold of me. And it says, Christ declared that the divine influence of the Spirit was to be with his followers unto the end. Unto the end. You know, you hear sometimes that the Holy Spirit's being taken out of the world at the end. And I think that's probably true, but it's only because people aren't asking for him. The Holy Spirit will be with his people to the end. But, she says, the promise is not appreciated as it should be, and therefore its fulfillment is not seen as it might be. The promise of the Spirit is a matter little thought of, and the result is only what might be expected. Spiritual drought, spiritual darkness, spiritual declension and death, minor matters occupy the attention. Minor matters occupy the attention and the divine power which is necessary for growth and prosperity is lacking though offered in its infinite plenitude and there's an infinite supply of it 
available, but we, we, don't, we don't ask for it. And it's, it's really kind of inexplicable. In, inexplicable. Um, my parents and I uh, and my sister went to an evangelistic series when I was eight years old. I won't tell you what year that was, but it was quite a while ago. Um, and at the end of that series, we were all baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, into Christ. Uh, and I, I will tell you, I loved growing up in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It, it, was, it was so much fun. <laughs> Full of fun activities, uh, you know, church, uh, uh, Sabbath school. You, Michelle, you talked about Sabbath school, uh, and then I don't know if it's this way now, but then uh, the Sabbath schools were at, were run by the kids, really. I mean, you had an adult that supervised, but the kids, in the, in the little bit older groups anyway, the kids participated in the Sabbath school class and kind of ran it, which was which was fun. Belong to the church choir, fun. Sabbath dinners, oh man, Sabbath dinners. Love Sabbath dinners with friends, family. Uh, usually uh, worship at the end of Sabbath, just a brief and then games on into the evening. Fun, fun, fun. Uh, oh, belong to Pathfinders, great. Camping. Halloween, putting your uniform on and go out and collecting cans for community services instead of candy, although some of us kind of slipped that in too, maybe before or after, but anyway. Uh, Christmas carols. So, you know, at Christmas time, gathering together and, and going out into the community and singing songs together. Wonderful. I had, had a great time. Went to TVA. We used to roller skate in the gym at TVA. Whatever happened to that? It, did that ruin the floors or something, and that's why they don't do that anymore? Or, or did just, you know, stop? Uh, TBA, graduated from there, went to Laurelwood. Uh, great place, although I will say that, uh, well, never mind about that. Uh, from there, went to Walla Walla, spent a year at Walla Walla, loved Walla Walla, but uh, I, was, I was in a hurry to grow up to become an adult. And so I left Walla Walla and went to work at the old Portland Adventist Hospital. That was a wonderful place to work. Uh, at shift change, you, you would um, have worship and then at the morning shift change, everyone would walk around the halls singing hymns to wake people up. It was, it was wonderful. I, I, really, I really enjoyed that. Um, and of course, because I wanted to grow up so fast, and if there's kids here that are 18 or 19, don't grow up so fast. But uh, I was in a hurry to get married. So uh, married my first wife. Uh, at age 19, three years later, we had two. We had one boy, and then three years after that, we had another son. That was great. But you know, my wife was very committed to the doing for Jesus. <laughs> she grew up in a conservative Adventist home, which is great. Um, but I, I would say we both failed to learn about what it means to, uh, for living in Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. We really did not learn that. Uh, you know, we were committed to keeping the rules and, you know, we all know the rules. We talked about some of the rules in Sabbath school class today uh, a little bit, but, uh, you know, there's God's 10 rules. We all know those, right? You know, no, uh, God, only, only God, uh, no idols. Don't, don't misuse the name of God. Sabbath, honor your parents, check, check, check. And so, you know, we were, we were checking off the list and yeah, we're pretty good, you know, not a problem. <sighs> you know, it's not a problem until you read uh, the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' explanation about the depths of the law. 
And then, of course, then it becomes more problematic because you have to try harder to, you know, meet those rules. Uh, you got to push that car a little, little harder. And, and there's always the fear that you're not, you know, you're not quite doing it right. And then, of course, there's the church rules, no meat. Well, she was a, 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 a vegetarian, so that was no problem. I was not, but I became a vegetarian. Uh, you know, no jewelry, which meant no wedding bands, unless you're an Adventist living in Europe, where they've always worn wedding bands. Um, you know, no going to the theater because your angel won't go there with you and you'll be lost, you know, unless we're having an evangelistic series there and then it's okay, uh, you know. And of course, no, no movies, but that got real fuzzy as TV became more and more popular. I'm really dating myself now, you know, but probably I, I would say the most destructive rule that we tend to follow is what I would call the human nature rule of love, which is transactional. I will love you as long as you love me in ways that I approve or as long as you act in ways that I approve. That's our love. It's transactional. It's not God's love. God's love is self-sacrificing. Uh, but when we, when we try and apply our love to God then we make him like us, transactional. And that's, that, is, that is so deadly. You know, we, we know that that's not, that's not the way it is. And yet we, we live that way and we talk that way. And, uh, you know, we, we go through life believing that that's how things should be. You're just, you're, you're doing for Jesus. You know, um, like I said, the deeper you look into the rules, though, uh, the more human nature, the flesh struggles against it. Uh, we see that in Paul's experience in Romans 7, one, uh, Romans 7, let's just read Romans 7, 4 through 6. So Romans 7, 4 through 6. Just waiting for the pages to stop turning. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh... The sinful passions which were in our members uh, to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. <sighs> and, you know, we read that, we talk about it, but I don't. I, I, I didn't get it in my own experience, that's for sure. Um, uh, you know, the I don't want to die is, is what the human nature does. It doesn't want to die, it want to live. And, <laughs> and the problem is that as you continue life in a rule-based living rather than continuous Holy Spirit living, it's terribly easy to develop a critical nature. And that's what I did. I just became critical. So I'd look at other people and say, well, they're not doing that. Well, that's not doing, you're not doing, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a, you know, it's a terrible thing. And of course, as, as, as you become critical, uh, you become a, what I would call a, a finger shaker. I had a, a guy that I worked with, brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, but you'd sit in meetings with him and it was always, you know, 
<laughs> you know, that kind of a thing, finger shaker. Um, and one time, his son, who, who was a teenager, was a great artist. And he drew a caricature of his dad, drew this nice picture that his dad put in his office and was so proud of it. But it was his dad sitting at his desk shaking his finger. <laughs> and I don't think he ever got the, the irony of it I, because he loved his son and he loved the picture. Uh, and of course, I've laughed about that all these years, but in retrospect, I, that was me too, you know, with, with spiritual things, with religious things. I was a finger shaker, a, a, you know, if you're not following the rules, then, then there's a problem. Uh, you know, and so you just dig deeper, you know, a deeper commitment for doing for Jesus, that always seems to be the answer when you're struggling. Um, and my wife and I were struggling with our relationship with each other and with God. Um, so, you know, when you're struggling with your relationship with each other and with God, what do you do? What do you do? do you, well, that'd be the right thing to do. But what we did, yes, that'd be the right thing to do, pray. But what we did was uh, focus on doing more for Jesus. So, you know, you just dig in and become more, more involved, more doing. And so, you know, we went to work for really a wonderful health education ministry a uh, nice place, but didn't take too long for us to realize that, you know, it's just people. And sometimes people come into those ministries uh, because they're like us, doing more for Jesus and not, not living in the spirit. And what we experienced was, you know, kids get dragged along in places like that. Our kids did too. And what we experienced was bullying by some kids. Uh, you know, you just wouldn't expect that. Uh, bullying, I, I suppose the thing that was disturbing for us, it's a small thing really, but disturbing for us in the end was because this was a health institute and they wanted everyone to reflect that. They actually had a discussion about checking staff groceries as you came onto the property. And it, that was just discussed. It was never implemented. Fortunately, saner heads prevailed. But uh, but we knew that really wasn't for us, and it wasn't helping our relationship. And so we left. And my wife, at the time, got so tired of pushing that car up the hill that she just gave up on Christianity altogether. So. And it, it's, you know, it's such a loss because she is a wonderful pianist, has a, a wonderful singing voice, uh, but all of that talent has been lost. And why? Because we didn't understand about living in the spirit. And we were just busy pushing that car up the hill until she just got too tired out and couldn't do it anymore. Um, uh, so, you know, we got divorced. My, my boys are both atheists. They're in their 40s. They're both atheists. And, you know, I don't blame them at all because the picture that I presented to them of God was this, this this, you know, do, no, you gotta, no, you gotta do this, no, 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 and, uh, you know, so, I actually have a better relationship with them now, because I just love them for who they are, I don't have to try and push them into some mold that they don't want to be in, into, uh, that, that was a dark, real dark point in my life, obviously, uh, getting divorced, but fortunately, the Lord, always watches out for us and brought Diane into my life, which was a blessing. You know, she is probably the sweetest, kindest person I know. So kind, we can't watch nature programs because she can't watch animals being hurt or killed. So no nature programs at all. You know, it's just, that's the way it goes. Um, uh, she wasn't an Adventist, so 
as we were dating, she came, came to church with me. And, you know, we'd talk about Sabbath and, you know, this and that and the other thing, what you can and can't do on Sabbath. And at one point she just said, just give me the list. <laughs> just give me the list. And, you know, you try and say to her, well, there isn't really a list, you know, other than the Ten Commandments and what it says. But it's about relationship. It's about relationship. Well, you know, all the rules are really about relationship. They're not, you know, when you keep the rules because you're keeping the rules because that's what you do, you keep the rules. Yeah, you, you're, you're pushing that car up the hill and you're going to get tired and you're going to get worn out and eventually it'll roll back over you and probably, you know, it'll, it'll be a problem. Uh, fortunately, I think fortunately, um, my parents were in their 90s and needed care and we made a place for them in our home and they came and stayed in our home with us. And uh, they were frail enough that they really couldn't go to church. So we just stopped going to church. You know, and I say that was a, a good thing, but it, it was a good thing for me at that point in time because I had had enough too pushing that car up the hill. <laughs> and at some point I just said, Lord, I, I'm, I'm done. I, I, you know, I've had enough. I just can't do this anymore. This pushing the car up the hill thing, it's not getting me anywhere at all. I don't like it. The fun's all been sucked out of it, you know, and fun's important. Uh, and it is important. It's important for kids to have fun. But it's important to understand that the fun has to lead us to living in the spirit and we just you know we don't do that anyway um yeah so you know at that point i cried enough and i, I you know i have to think that jesus was up there saying oh, man, finally <laughs> you know what did you have to do to get to that point finally it's what i've wanted you know, so you stop, you stop doing all of the things, and the decision was to go back to basics. Well, you know, what's the basics? What do I know that's the basics? <laughs> you know, uh, I know that God is love, not transactional love, but self-sacrificing love. And I thought, okay, I, okay, he's love, and he wants me to live that way. How? You know, how? How do I, how do I live that way? How do I get rid of that critical spirit? Oh, critical spirit, which, by the way, led me to church hopping. Have any of you done that? You know, you, you're looking for a church that meets your needs rather than a church that is in your community and that you can be part of and you can, you know, hopefully get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit, you know, you can be part of it. That uh, is part of that critical spirit. And that's what had to go, had to go. Um, let's read Romans 5. 6 and then 8 through 10. I mean, I'm just, these are things that I read in my study trying to look for what's the basic, you know, what do I know? What, what do I really believe? Strip away all of the other stuff, just all the, all the rule-based stuff. What, what is it that God wants? And so, yeah, so let me get there. Romans 5 verses 6 and then 8 through 10. Sure, yeah. Verse 6 says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Yeah, that was me. I, I was without strength... 
had no power and certainly ungodly. Skipping down to eight, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, his self-sacrificing love, in that while we were still sinners, me again, Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, me again, enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. You know, we, we read all of that down yeah, the, the sinner, the, without strength, the ungodly, uh, enemies, uh, and we were, de- we were justified. We were declared righteous even while we, were, while we were his enemies. He declared us righteous, and not just us, but the whole world declared us righteous and reconciled us through his blood. So again, the whole world... So why isn't the whole world saved? And I think the answer is in the last part. We shall be saved by his life. Yes, we were justified, reconciled, but we are at the cross, but we are saved by his life. Well, how do I, how how does that, how do I get that into me? How, How am I saved by his life? And especially his life of of love, his kind of love. And then I read Romans uh, 5, 5. Romans 5, 5. I love this verse. Now, hope does not disappoint. It doesn't disappoint because there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. So there's no fear in love. Our our hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. How? By the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Given to us. Well, when was it given to us? Oh, I better... Okay, I'm, I'm okay. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, okay, well, move on quickly. <sighs> yeah. You know, I had a, I had a professor that uh, uh, was taking a class on, on the book of Acts, and one of the first things he said was, you know that this book is named wrong. It, it calls it Acts of the Apostles, but it really should have been named Acts of the Holy Spirit in the Apostles, in the church. It's Acts of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, I was thinking, well, how do I get the Spirit? You know, how is the Spirit in me? And how do I know it's in me? Uh, And then, of course, you go back to those famous verses in John 3, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Let's go back to John. John 3. John 3. And let's read... Verse verse 3, and then 5 through 8. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Cannot see the kingdom of God. And then we go down to 5 through 8. And it says, and Jesus says again, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, you perceive it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And I thought about that, and, you know, you, he says you cannot see the kingdom of, of God in, uh, well, yeah, first he says you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Then he says you cannot see the kingdom of God. So there's seeing and entering. When does the kingdom of God come to us? We're Adventists. So we say, when Jesus returns, right? No, that's not what Jesus said, actually. <laughs> Go to Luke 17, 20. Luke 17, 20. Seventeen twenty. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, but indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Well, how? And when, you know, baptism, when we're baptized? Does the Holy Spirit come into us when we're baptized? Maybe. It's in Acts, if you read Acts, the Holy Spirit is in people before they're baptized. The Holy Spirit is in people when they're baptized. The Holy Spirit is in people after they've been baptized. So baptism doesn't seem to be the key But, you know, I learned that, that I needed the Holy Spirit. And so I was still trying to figure out, okay, how does that work? And I thought it was interesting, his, his talking about the wind. You know, the, the Holy Spirit is like the wind. You don't, you don't see it, you, you perceive it. Uh, you know, and we know what the gifts of the Spirit are. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness goodness, faith, faith. And, you know, we, sometimes we forget, yeah, we're given a little bit of faith, but faith grows and develops because it's a fruit of the Spirit. And we need that growth. Uh, and it's like, the, like how the wind blows. And Diane and I used to have some property that was way out in the sticks. I mean, way out away from anything. And, you know, when you're used to being in the city, there's lots of noise and lights and all of that stuff. But you went out there and you could stand out there in the dark. Uh, well, first of all, you, you stars, you couldn't even, it'd be hard to find the uh, constellations that you're so used to seeing in town because there's just so many stars, it's hard to pick it, pick it out from the... But the other thing that was always... That we both enjoyed much is that when you would stand out there and you could hear the wind blowing down through the trees from off the mountain and you could just hear it coming and hear it going. It, I don't know. It was something just amazing. But the Holy Spirit is like that. He's like that. And what we need to be doing is looking for the, the leaves moving <laughs> in ourselves and in others. And when, and when you invite the Holy Spirit to be in your life daily, constantly, it... That critical spirit goes away, or at least that's what that's my experience. It went away, and you know you you see things happening, and you realize it's not you. It's just <laughs> the, the leaves are being moved, or you see other people, and you see the Holy Spirit 
being active in other people because you see the leaves moving. Um, and and it's, it's, it's wonderful. And you're, that's how the kingdom is in you now is by inviting the Holy Spirit into your life. Not a baptism, although it's a good time, but every single day <laughs> and every moment of the day when you get up in the morning and you praise God for another day, as you get older, that becomes more important, for another day and before your feet hit the floor, you say, okay, I need the Holy Spirit show me it working in me today. <laughs> and that's, that's what I have found. And, and I would say, yeah, the kingdom of God is coming, but if it's not in you now, if, it's, if the Holy Spirit's not bringing the kingdom into your life now, will you be there? He wants it. He wants this. He wants, he wants the Holy Spirit to be in you now, his kingdom to be in you now, not, not at some point in the future. Yeah, we'll be in the kingdom and it'll be wonderful, but it can be wonderful now. Anyway, let's just bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us so much that you allowed your son to die for us, to show us what self-sacrificing love is all about, and that you promise, you've sent the Holy Spirit and promised the Holy Spirit to be in us if we will just ask. Lord, we thank you for these gifts the gift of, of love and salvation, the gift of your kingdom now. We thank you and praise your holy name. Amen.